evening and welcome to Between the Lines. I'm John Madison. My guest tonight is Professor Mills Soko, a political economist at the University of Cape Town. Mills has an especially interesting journey that I want to talk about a little bit. He completed his first degree at UCT during the transition from apartheid to democracy. But that meant he was able to work in and around Parliament in the early days when it was being set up. First at IDASA, the Institute for Democracy in South Africa, and later for the National Council of Provinces in the Research Department. At the same time, he continued his studies here and in the United Kingdom until he had a doctorate. Um, and the political economy is the link between politics and economics, which is so crucial to us and really needs a lot more consideration than we often give it. Mulsoko, welcome. Good evening, John. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming. Um, I want to start with uh, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has come back to the table. I mean, you know, President Zimbabwe, uh, President Mugabe has always talked about himself as uh, committed to independence for, for his country and uh, resisting imperialism. But he looks now more dependent than ever. Yes, uh, President Mugabe has uh, always spoken about uh, how important for Zimbabwe to become uh, independent, uh, to counter imperialism, to counter what he calls uh, colonialism, but uh, the country is back in trouble. And the latest wave of the troubles that Zimbabwe is facing has to do with external and domestic factors. The external factors uh, relate to issues that uh, have to do with the global economy, the slump in the global economy. Zimbabwe has uh, experienced a decline uh, in its demand for its gold and platinum exports uh, as a result of the slowdown in China and also the strong uh, U.S. Uh, dollar, which the country uses as its uh, currency. There's also a problem uh, that has to do with uh, deindustrialization in the country, the hollowing of the manufacturing sector. Isn't that a response to, a, a consequence of the, uh, the uh, ending of commercial agriculture and the, and the land invasion? It's partly that, John. It's partly that. Um, and also, you know, the... Uh, the agricultural sector, as you know, is the mainstay of the economy right. of Zimbabwe. And as a result of its dreadful export performance, the country has been suffering. And that has not been helped by the, uh, the problem of drought and uh, power shortages this country has been experiencing. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, Mugabe hasn't cr created a great deal of confidence for investment. Yes, there are serious uh, the governance failures, uh, domestic governance failures, in Zimbabwe. So the problems are externally induced, but uh, they go deeper. You know, their roots go deeper and they are domestically inspired. And they have to do with governance, they have to do with the uh, uh, inability of the, uh, and the refusal of the Zimbabwean government to implement, you know, structural reforms to revitalize the struggling economy. Now, uh, in the past, uh, President Mugabe felt he could turn east, he could go to China for help. And uh, China has been helpful in the past, right, including uh, getting involved during the uh, global political agreement that was negotiated by President Mbeki. Well, you know, the, the, the problems, the troubles that Zimbabwe is experiencing currently uh, represent a stunning repudiation of the country's look east policy. This is a policy which was announced amid fanfare by President Mugabe in 2003 which was designed to counter the sanctions that were being uh, considered by Western countries and to also build greater cooperation between Zimbabwe and Eastern countries, including China, Malaysia, Singapore, and the United Arab Emirates. And to a large extent, you know, it worked in favor of uh, China because it enabled China to strengthen its uh, footprint, economic footprint, uh, in Zimbabwe, and China also helped in terms of extending loans, a series of loans to uh, Zimbabwe, preferential and concessionary loans. But uh, China has uh, become tired of uh, having to bail out you know, Zimbabwe out of its troubles. So now uh, Mugabe has gone to China and China have refused? China have refused to extend a bailout package. Remember that Zimbabwe owes China close to 1.5 billion US dollars as a result of the loans that were extended uh, to Zimbabwe, to Harare. And it can't pay it back? Well, uh, Zimbabwe has defaulted on several of those loans, 
and China has made it very clear that it would not extend a rescue package or provide budgetary support until those have been uh, repaid. And is that because there's no, they don't see how they're going to get the money back? Of course. Uh, Zimbabwe, as you know, is bankrupt. Uh, it has run out of cash. And uh, China, you know, is uh, very clear on this that, uh, you know, Zimbabwe has to find its way uh, of, of uh, extracting itself out of the, the current economic uh, morass, and uh, that is the case at the moment. And the other interesting thing is, to start with, uh, China was the preferred partner to the West because it didn't make political demands and set political conditions. But Ch China has now started to set political conditions. Of course, uh, the relationship be between China and the Zimbabwe you know, dates back historically. China supported liberation. liberation, supported the liberation uh, struggle right. uh, in Zimbabwe. And China played a very important part uh, in, the, in recent years in terms of supporting um, the development of the global political agreement, working very closely with South Africa and other Southern African uh, countries. Um, however, what we see now is that China is becoming more assertive, especially under the leadership of President Xi Jinping. Yes. The time for freebies is gone. You know, China wants to make sure that its economic interests are, are, are preserved, and they've made several um, um, uh, what, conditions. What, what are the conditions now? The conditions, you know, as you know, President Mugabe went to China in 2014, 2014. And uh, the, the vice president, uh, Emerson Nangagwa, went to, to China in 2015. They came back empty-handed. And China has made it very clear that it will not extend any rescue package until the issue of political succession has been sorted. That is the first issue. There is also the issue of party renewal, ZANU-PF renewal. China has made it clear that they need to renew the party, need to revitalize the party. There's the issue of corruption, especially uh, insofar as state-owned enterprises are concerned. And then there is the issue of uh, domestic reforms, uh, reforming the economy, and uh, specifically the issue of the high public sector wage bill, which um, accounts for 80% of the national budget in Zimbabwe. We're going to have to take a break. We'll be back in a moment with Professor Mills Soko. And we're back with Professor Mills Soko. So you were saying before the break that the Chinese have set conditions, and the conditions for, for renewing any kind of support to uh, President Mugabe it boiled down to the succession and some political and economic reforms. In a nutshell, what are they asking for? They got, they've got their own candidate that they want to see as the next president. Well, it is widely believed that the Chinese prefer uh, to have uh, the current vice president Emasim Nangagwa as the successor to President Mugabe. The Chinese have a very long history of working with uh, Mr. Mnangagwa. Uh, you know, he trained in China uh, in the 1960s, uh, he pro you know, as a military uh, operator there. He's considered pretty ruthless. He's got quite a, a background, a controversial background, uh, but he's also considered competent. Well, he has a, a very a checkered history um, of having been involved in some of the uh, unsavory episodes in Zimbabwe's history, uh, the massacre in Matebele land, and also his role and close relationship with the security agencies uh, in Zimbabwe. Remember, he's probably the only minister in the President Mugabe's cabinet who has been in office since 1980 when the country became um, independent, and he has served in all the cabinets in various positions as a minister of state security, of defense, he was in charge of the Central Intelligence Organization, which is uh, the spy agency in Zimbabwe. He's also been Minister of Justice, so he's uh, very close to the security uh, interests uh, in Zimbabwe. And uh, of course, uh, he's currently positioning himself as a reformer, as somebody who can be trusted with undertaking the necessary reforms that re Zimbabwe requires to get itself out of the current troubles. So ironically, Mnangagwa, could find himself with the support, or seems to find himself with the support, not only of China, but also of local business interests, even white interests. Um, there are quite a lot of apparently conflicting groups that seem to think he's the best way forward. Well, there are several interests that are coalescing around him, uh, primarily the security agencies, 
uh, in Zimbabwe, but there's also opposition to his possible candidature, especially from the group that is, is known as Generation 40, a group of young Turks uh, within the Zimbabwean political establishment, including such uh, leaders as Jonathan Moyo, as Seves Kasukuwere, uh, who have also teamed up with the First Lady, Grace Mugabe. So it won't be an easy ride for him. He's in a strong position, uh, but it will be difficult. Uh, it will be a difficult path ahead. So Mugabe can't get his money from China, but I've seen for several weeks now they've had trouble paying, paying their own soldiers, which is the one thing that Mugabe always tried to do, no matter how bad things got in the country. He's got, now gone to the International Monetary Fund and to the West? Of course. Um, you know, th that represents a very important realisation that the Look East policy that President Mugabe adopted in 2003 has failed because it was designed specifically to counter Western influence, to counter Western pressure. Now it's gone back to Western international financial institutions. And uh, Zimbabwe owes those institutions close to 1.8 billion US dollars. They've made it very clear that uh, he has to repay uh, you know, the, the arrears, and, and as in addition to that, he has to undertake structural reforms. So uh, I think this uh, is a, a very clear case of uh, humiliation on the part of Mugabe, you know, having uh, seen in the past few weeks his finance minister, you know, traversing the Western capitals with a begging bowl, looking for money. So he's in debt to the West, he's in debt to the East. He's indebted to China, <laughs> and he's indebted to the West. And what will be the outcome? I, I mean, will, he, will he knuckle under to IMF reforms? Well, you know, he, th there is a, a very strong uh, uh, school of thought in, in Zimbabwe, championed by um, the Vice President Mnangagwa and Chinamasa, that Zimbabwe has no option but to reform. And in so doing, uh, it will require the support of Western countries and Western financial institutions uh, in particular. Uh, but there are some uh, within the political establishment who are really wary of that. They're skeptical of that. They're skeptical of uh, Western institutions uh, having a stranglehold over the Zimbabwean political economy. So there is an internal struggle within the ZANU-PF as to what the direction should be. And uh, President Mugabe is seen as one of the important barriers to meaningful reform, structural reform in Zimbabwe. So as long as it's there, it will be difficult for the so-called reformers to undertake the kind of programs that they want to, to undertake. And Remember, they, uh, John, there is a, a, an economic blueprint which the Zimbabwean government adopted. It's called Zim Asset, which was essentially designed to revitalize the economy, but it has failed completely because due to lack of funding. So this is a very serious challenge that the, the leadership uh, in Zimbabwe faces, especially the so-called reformers. In the uh, uh, 90 seconds before the break, where, where is South Africa in all of this? Because in the President Mbeki era, we did provide some loans. Are we available to give loans now under President Zuma and uh, Minister uh, Pravin Gordon? John, um, South Africa you know, is a, has a very important role to play uh, in Zimbabwe, given that Zimbabwe is our largest trade partner in Africa. In Africa. It's a very important regional uh, state, especially in terms of security uh, in the SADC region. Uh, we are host to millions of Zimbabweans uh, here who are migrants in this country. Zimbabwe. And, and so uh, we have an important role to play. And I believe that South Africa has to engage in Zimbabwe, it has to work with the SADC partners, it has to work with financial institutions uh, you know, to address issues related to political succession, the issues of of economic reform, and also ensuring that uh, Zimbabwe is back on a sound footing. Essentially, you're saying that the, we're dealing with, I don't know, failed state is the right term, but a failing, a failing state. Failing state. Yes. And, and its neighbors like South Africa can't, can't uh, uh, be silent. The danger is that with the security situation uh, deteriorating, you just mentioned earlier uh, the situation related to non-payment of salaries. Uh, to, uh, to the army uh, and to the, the police. That is a, a scenario that uh, we, we saw in the Congo under Mobutu Sese and that is what led to Mobutu's ousting in, uh, in uh, 
in the Zaire, the then Zaire. So uh, this is a very serious situation. Um, there's a lot of uh, unhappiness, there's a lot of disenchantment. We saw uh, in the last week the war veterans or a faction of the war veterans, they issued a declaration very critical of Mugabe and pledging that uh, in the next elections, in 2018, they will not support uh, the Mugabe regime. So it's a very delicate situation in terms of security and that is why in my view it is important for South Africa to engage proactively, work with China, with our SADC partners, as well as the Western um, international financial institutions to ensure that uh, uh, the situation is stabilized in Zimbabwe. We have to go to a break in a moment, but just before we do a very quick uh, question, if I may, what is, is South Africa fully engaged in Zimbabwe now? It's not very clear. It's not very clear if uh, South Africa is fully engaged. My impression is that uh, it is not. Uh, it's just watching the events as they unfold. Um, and so I would like to see a more directed, you know, tailored engagement on behalf of Pretoria, you know, in, in, in Harare. We're going to have to take another break. When we come back, we're going to carry on talking to Professor Mills Soko, and we're going to look at South Africa and China as well. And we're back with Professor Mills Soko. So just to finish off this part of it, South Africa hasn't come forward with money for, for Zimbabwe this time. As far as I know, uh, South Africa hasn't. But there is a proposal that has been uh, floated, which essentially entails inviting Zimbabwe to adopt the rand as its currency to help with its uh, economic problems, and also to invite uh, Zimbabwe to become a member of the Southern African Customs Union. Uh, it's not very clear if uh, President Mugabe would, uh, you know, given that he's a very proud man, would allow uh, Zimbabwe to, you know, to adopt our currency is, as its is, national currency. Is that, in a sense, South Africa setting conditions? Well, um, South Africa, you, you know, previously Mugabe, President Mugabe has approached, uh, uh, during the, the Mbeki era, has approached the South African government you know, requesting aid, and South Africa rebuffed him. You know, they, they promised to pro provide him with one billion US dollars. And uh, he was not pleased with that, and uh, so South Africa rebuffed him. Um, I'm not aware of any plan to extend any financial aid to Zimbabwe, um, uh, you know, today. In any case, given our serious domestic economic problems, I, I don't think that uh, that, would be, that would be wise on behalf of South Africa. I think. Uh, in the end, Zimbabwe's problems have to do with dreadful domestic governance. And we need to work very closely with uh, Zimbabwe to address its domestic governance issues and uh, ensure that we rally the support of the international community, especially Western financial institutions, uh, to provide the kind of help that Zimbabwe requires, you know, financial support. But on condition that, uh, you know, the, the kinds of it can't be a free-for-all, it can't be freebies, on condition that the, 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 the political challenges and the economic challenges that uh, face the country are addressed. I want to move towards South Africa, but last question on the South Africa-Zimbabwe relationship, because we don't seem to debate in a serious way uh, these questions of foreign policy like Zimbabwe, and I'll come to China in a moment. Do we not have to face a look at whether we got it right in the first place. Were we right in supporting Mugabe in the way we did and resisting the opposition and, and staying silent about the violations of, of, of um, good election management uh, in the last 10, 20 years? Jordan, there are several views about uh, President Mbeki's quiet diplomacy. Um, you know, some we supported his stance and which some which uh, criticized him. And he was in particular criticized heavily uh, in Zimbabwe because he was seen to be complicit with what, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the problems that the country was experiencing, the atrocities um, that were, were committed. I think uh, in retrospect, you know, subsequently he did very well in terms of laying the foundation for the creation of the global political agreement, which uh, President uh, Zuma built on, and that did
did, in my view, contribute towards the stabilization of the politics and the economy of Zimbabwe. And uh, things started to, to fall apart you know, after the end of the, this government of national unity. And uh, the problems that uh, Zimbabwe is experiencing now really have to do with the, the policy errors and the incompetence of the ZANU-PF government. Another area that you, you've uh, written and talked about a lot is, is China's role in Southern Africa and South Africa's relationship with China. Uh, very briefly, China, you know, the, the debate in South Africa about China is sort of a debate among the deaf. The, there are the sort of sentimental adherents to China and the vociferous opponents of China. But it seems to me that China sometimes does good and sometimes does bad in, in, in Southern Africa and in the whole of Africa. Of course, you know, China has a specific interest in Africa. It's, uh, it's interested in acquiring um, commodities, uh, our mineral resources, in order to drive growth back home in, uh, in China. It's interested in accessing African markets to sell us goods, to sell us stuff. Uh, it's interested in garnering diplomatic support, especially uh, in the United Nations Security Council, uh, where uh, it requires the support of uh, African countries in terms of the positions that it takes uh, in, those, uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in those structures. There has been criticism, of course, of, uh, of, of China's uh, practices in Africa in, uh, in some respects uh, in relation to how it, uh, it props up rogue states, how it, uh, it uh, does not um, uh, intervene in, in countries where uh, human rights abuses are prevalent. Well, and we, we, sorry, I'm sorry yes, to interrupt yes. you, but we're running out of time, and I do want to get to this one last point, yes. which is South Africa has sent its whole cabinet to, to China for political training, and many others right down to town manager level. I find this curious. How do you train South Africans who are adhered, must adhere to our constitution in a Chinese political system? Isn't there a conflict there, contradiction there? Well, th there's a lot that's, that is positive that you can learn from China. This is a country that has undertaken massive reform since 1978 sure. to move from where it was as a basket case to become the second largest economy in the world. Absolutely. That is a, an impressive feat. Uh, but of course, there are many things about China that are not uh, in line with what we believe uh, in this country you know, to, be, to be constitutional or to be in line with our commitment to certain values. So I believe that our approach to China should be a pragmatic one. We should learn uh, and adopt what we think is good for our country and to reject what is not good for this country. And you know, remember, John, China is now South Africa's largest trade partner. It's a very important partner and one of the countries in Africa, apart from Nigeria, that have a strategic partnership agreement in this China, with China. My, my criticism is that I don't think that we have done enough to take advantage and to learn the, the important lessons, the positive lessons from our relationship with China. Mm. Uh, we, we gain, we're, we're out of time. I want to thank you for a, a very, uh, very enlightening uh, conversation. Uh, before we leave, we, we, I, I'm going to recommend the book this week uh, is called uh, Musi Maimani, Prophet or Puppet. Of course, it's about the DA leader, and you know we're in elections. The author is Stimbiso Musomi, the journalist. It's an interesting book. It's uh, informative about uh, Musi Maimani. It doesn't answer the question, Prophet or pu Puppet. Uh, I think it leaves the question mark hanging, but it does give you a great insight into the man and the research is sound and it's well written and I heartily recommend it. Well, that's our show. Thank you for watching. Good night and happy reading.